Today's session, AI and Operations, Tapping the Potential and Avoiding the Pitfalls, is pre presented by Professor Mark Fagan. Mark Fagan is a lecturer in public policy at Harvard Kennedy School. Mr. Fagan teaches operations management, systems thinking, and supply chain management and policy development in the degree program. In executive education programs, he teaches about service delivery, strategy, and cross-boundary cross collaboration. He leads the school's autonomous vehicles policy initiative through the Taubman Center for State and Local Government. Mark Fagan has consulted to management in the private and public sectors on strategy issues for more than 30 years and was a founding partner of Norbridge Inc., a general management consulting firm with a distinctive com competence in the transportation sector. Thank you so much for joining us today, for Mark, for this important topic. Over to you. Well, thank you for the welcome and to welcome all of you. When you hear the term artificial intelligence or AI, are you intimidated? Well, I'll have to share with you, I was. Let me take you back to 2010. Uh, if you can't remember back that far, here are some highlights. In 2010, we had the first introduction of the iPad. The swine flu pandemic was, a we thought, a pandemic. We've learned a lot more since. Uh, the BP oil spill took place and Mark Zuckerberger was the Time Magazine Person of the Year. Uh, can you recall anything you were doing in 2010? Well, I can. I recall being at uh, the boardroom of CSX, which is one of the largest freight railroads in the United States. And I was doing a presentation on the power of aerial drones. Drones had become a potential opportunity for really driving productivity and generating safety. And I had just completed showing a video to the senior management team of the potential and power of this capability. We were showing how it could be used to look at bridges and inspect them, or you could look at a terminal area and see who had a hard add-on, who didn't. You could look at grade crossings to see whether the arms were coming down and cars were stopping. Everyone was enthusiastic about it. And at the end of the session, the CEO turned to uh, the tech team and said, make this happen. We're getting up. Everyone's kind of doing the usual, hey, great to see you. And the CEO comes over to me and says, hey, tell me this, what do you think about AI and does that have a lot of potential for us? Fortunately, after a lot of years in consulting, I wasn't too flustered, even though truth be told, I did not know much about it. And I said, you know, this is a really important topic, one that's gonna take a lot more than just a quick several minute conversation. Why don't we get to back together in a couple of weeks and we can work through this? Well, over those two weeks, I did a lot of learning about what AI is and became convinced that it really had tremendous potential in so many domains. Over the past decade, I've continued to follow it and continue to apply the tools and techniques of AI in order to improve the performance of operations. The goal of this session is to make sure you are not intimidated and that you learn how you can use AI, hopefully to improve your world. Spoiler alert, uh, you're probably already using AI. And what is new is the level of sophistication it can bring. And at the end of the day, I hope I'll convince you that the juice is worth the squeeze, that it takes energy and effort and thought, but AI can deliver real value. In order for us to have some context for this, I wanna take us to one discipline in particular that I focus on, and that's operations. No matter what the organization is that you're a part of, I can assure you that you have in your organization a lot of operations that take place. Whether this is in a hospital, in a school system, running the registry of motor vehicles, uh, highways, running TSA, for example, all of these public services or nonprofits require very important operations to be effectively managed 
to be successful. In this domain, the objective and what really defines success is being able to deliver quality services with effectiveness and with equity. Now, I got to add to this the piece that is also you've got to have cost in mind because no matter what the organization is, cost matters. Now, if we can deliver quality, efficiency, equity, and we can do that consistently, wow, we have really made a difference. Now, in order to do this, we actually have built a pretty robust toolkit to make it happen. Here are some examples. Uh, if you're in the operations management world, we have forecasting techniques. How do I determine the demand, the number of people that will be coming through a TSA checkpoint at a particular point in time? We have capacity analysis, the techniques to be able to determine if I have a capacity to move 100 people through a line and I've got an arrival rate of 20 per minute, how well can I operate that? Where is the bottleneck? So we've got that capability. TQM, total quality management. Since the 1950s, we've been really focused on what do you do to ensure that when you deliver a healthcare service, it comes with quality. Queuing, one of my favorite areas. Queuing is about how do you manage lines? You know this because you experience them all the time. It may well be that you are at the Registry of Motor Vehicles experiencing it, but you also experience it in everyday life. The grocery store, going to a restaurant. And here we have some interesting dynamics. Generally, we don't want lines, but think if you're a restaurateur some lines aren't necessarily bad because if people are waiting, they're probably at the bar buying the highest margin activity uh, they can do. In addition, having a little bit of a line is a bit of social proof. Hey, this must be a really good restaurant if people are willing to wait. We've again, over the past several decades, worked on refining process re-engineering. More recently, there's been a focus on behavioral science and behavioral economics to create nudges to get people to do things a little bit differently. And we've also got this idea of system dynamics, recognizing that almost no matter what business or activity you do, you don't sit there in isolation. You are part of a broader system and how that fits together. And for system dynamics, we've actually got some interesting tools and models to make that happen. When you look at this, what you can see is that some of these are more qualitative, total quality management, the behavioral nudges, process re-engineering, but many of them are highly analytical. So let me give you one example. I mentioned before, I really am interested in lines and queuing. So on the left, what you're seeing is a pretty typical way in which we think of how lines form. There's an arrival process. You put a fancy term process. It's really just how do people arrive? They stand in lines. Is it a single line? Is it multiple lines like in the grocery store? Or is it a single line like at TSA? We have people who process us, that's the service processors right here in the middle, and then we have the completed work. If it's TSA, this is you going and now putting your shoes back on and everything back into your bag. Understanding the structure of this allows us then to put some real math against how to optimize how we think about lines. And what you're looking at on the right-hand side are the, you determine the line management approach based on what's the probability of the line being empty or it's being busy. How many people are in the line? How long do they wait in the line? How many people do you have serving? And you can see there's some pretty hefty math over here that enables us to do this. So if we have these analytical tools then what is the purpose of AI? How does AI matter?
And the answer to that is that AI is going to take our analytical approaches and make them even more powerful. Now, when we think about AI, I suspect it means a lot of different things to different people. As a way to understand it, let me share with you an example of word association with artificial intelligence. I'll highlight a few. Deep learning, machine learning, data science, chat box, blockchain. You can look at this and see lots of these. I suspect many of them say to you, oh my gosh, what does that really mean? What does machine learning really mean? What are, what is blockchain anyway? So given that this is the reality of this, how people think about artificial intelligence, our first step in demystifying it is to define it. So let me turn to a definition. Artificial intelligence, the ability of a digital computer or a computer controlled robot to perform tasks commonly associated with intelligent beings, us. The term is frequently applied to the project of developing systems endowed with the intellectual process characteristics of humans, such as the ability to reason, discovering meaning, generalization, and learning from the past. So this is a lot packed into a single definition. So let me unpack it a little bit for you. The first word I want to highlight is the word ability. This is not saying you don't play a role. This is saying you're providing some, a computer the ability to take actions. And the actions are actions that we would normally take. Essentially, what you are trying to do is enable that computer to think in the same way you do. And in particular, I wanna highlight the ability to reason. The ability to reason is to take a lot of information, synthesize it, understand its implications, and then take action. That's what we do constantly, every day. You do it every day, probably every minute. It's now trying to embed that capability in a computer or robot instead of us. In addition, there's the idea of discovering meaning. Oftentimes, you, we find, especially in my world of operations, mountains of data. People give you tons of data, but data is not information or actionable unless it's been digested, unless you can look at it and discover patterns, discover meaning. In some cases, we're really good at that. In other cases, it actually gets so complex that kind of our minds blow up and we don't know how to do it. Here, AI may be able to assist us in that process. The final piece I wanna highlight is the idea of learning from the past. AI is really in its kind of ultimate form, being able to do again what we do which is we learn from the past. Except here, I think we humans have a little bit of a fallibility. We don't always remember what we screwed up in the past. And so the computer is trying to help us be better at that. So this is a definition. I hope as you kind of absorb it, it, it resonates for you and it makes some sense. Now, AI, has, is not a brand new concept. In fact, oops, it's been around for quite some time. It actually dates back to the 1950s when a few academics came up with the term to describe trying to make machines smarter. And so from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, the term artificial intelligence really meant okay, I'm going to take a computer, I'm going to program it to do something. That's it. Now, once you've done that, 
by the time you get to the 1990s and 2000s, you're starting to say, now, wait a minute. Do I have to explicitly program every action I want the computer to take? Or alternatively, can I let the computer think for itself? And when I say think for itself, essentially learn by itself. And you do that for about 20 or 30 years. And all of a sudden, the capacity of computers and our understanding of how effectively you can program computers leads to this idea of deep learning. And deep learning is the idea of, can we replicate in a computer the way our brains are wired together, the neural network as people describe it. Given this progression, let me zero in on the right-hand side of the slide to give you a little more sense of what we're talking about. So artificial intelligence you can see is the big circle. You can think of it as the umbrella under which all of these different activities take place. So it is doing double duty. It is the term that's used as the umbrella, but it is also the term that's used for programming a computer to take a specific action. The next level down is the idea of machine learning. And again, that is the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. And then deep learning is trying to create algorithms that help us think more like our brain might think. So let me try and give you an example of this. And the example I'm going to use is spell check. So when I was putting my notes together for this, I was typing away. I am a horrible typist, and probably every third word is misspelled. Now, if I use spell check at the highest level, the most basic level of spell check is it looks at every word. So there's a computer that's been programmed to look at a word. It takes that word, it bounces it against a dictionary, and it says, if that word is in the dictionary, ignore it. If that word is not in the dictionary, put that little squiggle red line underneath it. That's the idea of kind of your basic programming. For those of you who are of a certain age, you may remember the very first program you wrote was a series of if-then statements. If this, then that. So that's the first level. Now, the second level is to enable the machine to learn. So if I use the word transportation a lot, and for some reason I can't spell it right, and what comes up in this second level of machine learning is instead of just saying, hey, you spelled it wrong, now it's going to say, hey, not only did you just spell it wrong, but do you want transpiration or transportation? And every time I click on transportation. Machine learning would say that that program, after the fourth time of me always going for transportation, would either reverse the order, put the transportation on the top, or it would automatically correct it. That's the idea behind self-improvement in the computer programs. The last piece of this, the deep learning, is where you start to type and the computer automatically starts filling it in. It can think logically about where you're going with this sentence. Now, the deep learning, not there so well, at least in my version of Word, but it's headed in that direction. The example I can give you of deep learning is IBM's Watson. Uh, you may remember about 2010, they developed this computer. Initially, it played Jeopardy games and became very successful, but it has since gone on to be used, especially in the medical community, to try and project and understand the diagnosis 
of different uh, issues that, that people have, medical issues. So this is essentially the essence of how we've seen the evolution of AI take place. And hopefully the spell check example gives you a little flavor for how we're gonna be looking at this. Now, when it comes to AI, there are a lot of technologies that are being used in order to achieve the objective. So one of them is image analysis. It can identify in a picture, is there a cat in this picture? Now, some of you have experienced this particular technology when you are being asked by a computer program to prove you're not a bot. You may have seen they have typically 12 windows or 16 windows, and it says, highlight all of the windows that have a crosswalk in them. Essentially, the computer is taking that and trying to analyze that image. That's a very simple case. More sophisticated examples are using facial recognition to identify who you are. Another example is predictive analytics kind of takes us back to that queuing theory where you're writing models that take lots of different variables into account to better predict when will this bus break down. Hopefully, you know it in advance so you can fix it so you're not stranded. Other examples, natural language processing. All those incredibly annoying uh, telephone conversations you have with a computer, Essentially, that's what's happening. The last one I just want to highlight for you is self-driving technologies. This is an area that I have some uh, interest in, and we'll come back and talk about that uh, towards the end. The application range that you can find these technologies being used in is really broad-based. Uh, certainly, I suspect you've seen it with healthcare, uh, or we'll talk more about automobiles. Finance, social media has examples of it. Gaming certainly does this, robotics. The areas in which you can find this taking place are really endless. But to have some kind of specifics for us to work on, rather than just kind of go across the board, I want to come back and apply the ideas of AI specifically in the area of operations management. And let me, let me remind you one more time of our mantra, deliver quality services cost effectively with equity. I want to zero in though on a few that I think have the greatest near-term potential to make a difference. So let me start with customer experience. No matter what your field is, you're in a hospital, you're in a school, you're in a police department, uh, you're in the Department of Public Works, every one of us has customers. And that experience really dictates how well I deliver quality services. I need to understand what is meant by quality and how the experience of the individual is felt. Another important use case in operations is supply chain management. Now here, every one of us is now aware of supply chain management. I've been teaching it for years. All of a sudden, students actually know what it is and they want to take the class. We've all, since the pandemic began, have seen the impacts of supply chains. Well, supply chains are not easy to manage. AI can really make it more effective. And we'll talk more about that. In terms of predictive analytics, I used the example of a bus breaking down. That's one example, but there are lots of other examples. One of the most powerful ones, one I'm completely enamored with right now, is the issue around using the viral load in wastewater to predict the demand for healthcare services in COVID. So what we've discovered is that the wastewater is about a two week advance notice of when hospitals will see a spike in need to provide for COVID patients. Thinking through how you use that wastewater 
to understand the analytics, to understand what the impacts are. Very powerful, very AI. And the last example I wanted to just zero in on is real-time operations management. And here, what I can think about is warehouse management. If any of you have seen a sophisticated warehouse, uh, you can go look at uh, online, you can see an Amazon warehouse, a uh, um, Walmart warehouse, lots and lots of different people show them. They are incredibly sophisticated operations these days. And how you manage those, again, with AI, can be very powerful. So these are just some examples. These are four that I think from my world are particularly important, but hey, you may say, no, what really matters to me is I'm trying to better understand risk management and AI can help me better predict the impact, the, the probability of a cyber attack and the impact it's going to have. So these are all examples. I want to though, recognize that as we think about AI, in many ways, we have already AI in operations. What's different is now we're putting those existing tools on steroids. And I want to highlight two for you to give you a flavor for what I'm talking about. On the left-hand side, you can see thinking about AI to help with forecasting. Now, we typically in organizations do forecasting. We may be forecasting how many bus operators we need. We may be forecasting how long the line will be at the Registry of Motor Vehicles. We may be forecasting how many students will enroll in our fall schools. What we typically do though, is <clears throat> we have typically created perhaps correlations, perhaps linear regressions to try and do a little bit of forecasting. What AI enables us to do is to look at a broader array of issues. So if you're running a highway, I'm looking at one right here, you care about how many cars are gonna be moving along, but how many cars and how much potential congestion there is, is not just a, fact, a factor of the traditional on a Wednesday at 1130, how many cars are flowing. It's impacted by the weather. Got snowy days, you're gonna have a lot fewer cars, but they're gonna be going a lot slower. Have a beautiful day in the summer, fewer cars probably. As you try and unpack that and predict what's likely to happen, it gets really complex really quickly. AI can help take those multitude of important variables and using machine learning, see the patterns, forecast what's likely to happen. If you can improve the quality of your forecast by five to 10%, it makes a huge difference in the quality experience of the customer, as well as the efficiency of the operation. Now, you're looking, I suspect, with probably a little bit of puzzlement at the right-hand side of this page. Uh, only in this seminar will you learn about slippery rail. Now, I suspect none of you on the call are familiar with slippery rail, so give me a minute to explain it. Uh, when you run a commuter railroad, especially in New England, uh, in the fall, leaves fall from the tree and they go on the tracks. It turns out that <clears throat> if they are wet and they're on the tracks, the steel wheel on the steel rail doesn't adhere as well and it's harder to stop. And if you are a commuter operator, you do not want that train sliding through the station. You want it to stop where it's supposed to stop. Well, it turns out that on the this is not a trivial problem. Now you could say, well, how hard can it be? If there are leaves on the, on the rails, you go a little slower. If there aren't, you go faster. Well, it turns out it's a little more complex because the amount of slipperiness, what you're seeing is that vertical, is a function not only about the amount of leaves on the train, it's also a function of how much moisture there is. 
If there's no moisture, not a problem. Interestingly, if there's a ton of moisture, it's not a problem. There's this mist level that is just right here that makes it incredibly slippery. It is, you can see just from the visual representation, extraordinarily difficult to think through in my own mind, how do I want to work through this problem? When do I slow the train? When do I not slow the train? Do I need to change the schedules or not? AI is really good at this. It can essentially tell you for this amount of moisture, this amount of leaves, here's what you need to do in terms of your braking. So these are examples of taking existing kind of tools we have in our toolkit and enhancing them with AI. AI also though for operations can bring us to some new tools. So the top you're looking at uh, an airport security screening facility, you're looking at it, it's picking up your image, all you have to do is look and it says you're on your way. So here, this is an example of using new AI to make an operation, in this case, security screening, which can be one of the most frustrating experiences you have on your vacation, simple. I mentioned before the automation of warehouses, Robotics have become very powerful. On the bottom, on the left, you're looking at a robot that's doing picking in a highly uh, climate controlled environment. So we don't have concerns about kind of your body temperature impacting the, the temperature of the, the, in this case, pharmaceuticals that are there. On the bottom right, you're looking at the application of fertilizer for crops. AI in agriculture has just exploded. And whether it's how you determine where best to apply the fertilizer, it isn't just you're flying over the fields and putting it evenly. You're actually using AI, visual recognition information and soil moisture information and crop uh, maturation information to determine when and how to apply it. These are really powerful examples. When you sit back and want to have one example that I can share with you, where we're covering the waterfront of AI, it is in autonomous vehicles. Autonomous vehicles use the full suite of AI. Now, if you have been in San Francisco recently, or in Singapore, or in Lyon, France, uh, I suspect you have seen autonomous vehicles. Uh, in San Francisco right now, you have Waymo out there with their autonomous vehicle. Uh, you have Cruise, which is a GM product, and they are running up and down. And very recently, Waymo got approval for revenue service with no safety driver in them. Until very, until very recently in the US, there was typically a safety driver. If you've been on college campuses, uh, some retirement communities, uh, and in other geographies, you may have ridden on one of these autonomous little shuttles, eight, 10 people. And here, the computers that are driving this are literally driving it. You're not doing anything. Now, to make this work, let me show you what's required. There is a ton of technology. The technology includes LIDAR, radar, which are seeing what's happening around you and bringing it into the computer. It's got video cameras that are bringing live feed in to what's happening around you in real time. All of that information is being brought into a huge computer sitting back here that is essentially making the same decisions you would make, maybe even better decisions than you would make in order to get the car from point A to point B. In doing so, you can see examples of the wide kind of capabilities of AI. At a more basic level, kind of the original 
artificial intelligence thought process are the breaking algorithms. So what's happening is real time every second, the computer is picking up what's my speed, what's my mass, what's happening on the trajectory of the road, how far am I from the vehicle ahead of me or the stop sign ahead of me, and when should I start braking so that just when I get to that stop sign, I've stopped perfectly. Not jerking, not back here, just right. So that's one example. Another example is where the cameras are taking images and seeing real time. Okay, there's a car on my left, there's a car on my right. I need to make sure I stay in this lane. Even though I want to take a left hand turn, there are cars coming at me. I can't take it until I am clear. So here, that's much more machine learning. Now, while I am an enthusiast of this, I need to share with you, it is not really ready fully for prime time. You can do it in a test mode, that's fine. And the way it works in a test mode, or as it's being done in San Francisco, is it uses machine learning one more time to understand the route it's on. And it maps that route. And every time it goes over that route, it looks at what is happening at the corner of Sacramento and Mason Street. And it is taking that information and adding it into the database so that it has a greater probability of expecting every new day what's going to happen at that intersection. And it gets smarter and smarter. So the, to make you feel a little more comfortable, these routes that the AAVs are on have been mapped hundreds, thousands of times, both in real world and in a simulator, to try and get that machine to understand all the possibilities that are out there. But it also has some fail safes because there are new events that take place every day. Now, let me give you one example here where the full AI suite, and here I'm going to talk about neural networks, hasn't quite made it all the way. Picture yourself at a four-way stop sign. So cars come into the four-way stop sign. I won't ask you how you think about it. I'll tell you how I think about it. I look at the car that are already there. I look at the car, I look at the driver, and I make an assessment about how aggressive are they versus how aggressive I am and make my determination of, come on, or I'm going. Now, I suspect everyone does that. Think about an AV. If we really got to the neural network, if we really got to that level, the AV would make that same determination. It is not able to do that. First, it has a hard time seeing the eyes of the other drivers because the eyes tell you a lot. Are they looking like they're gonna go or are they looking to say to you to come along? There are so many signals that take place that we go through our mind that aren't necessarily yet uh, effective as a programming. However, having said that, they're coming and they are a great example of AI what I'd like you to be thinking about is, I suspect very few of you are involved in AVs, but how can you use this type of technology, these types of approaches to be successful? Now, it would not be appropriate to wrap this up without spending some time talking about the risks, because there are some very significant risks associated with artificial intelligence. I want to zero you in initially on the top left, the performance risk, and in particular to talk about errors and bias. We have seen examples of using AI for determining probation periods uh, for people, for screening resumes that have failed miserably. And they've failed miserably because there are embedded biases that have been programmed into the computer that the computer is got as a foundation that may now be being modified, but they're modified off the wrong base. And if you're modified off the wrong base, you just perpetuate 
problems. So there are some really significant issues here. I want to add one more, and it's an example from autonomous vehicles. One of the safety devices are cameras. Those cameras are trying to pick up people, especially at night. Well, if you are darker skinned, the technology doesn't pick that up as well. And so we've got a potential problem here that if I'm not picking that up, there is real bias. And that bias turns into potential real disequities and safety concerns. So as you're thinking about AI, remember, you're only as good as how you design it at the outset and how the rules of learning take place. So that's one very important risk. A second important risk is around ethics. How do I make decisions where it's not a human anymore, but it's a computer? I'll take you to AVs one more time. Uh, the autonomous vehicle has to make a determination it's, uh, of what happens if there is going to be a crash. So sometimes, no matter how well you plan, something happens. And so the AV, if someone's walking across the street and it doesn't have time to stop, has to make a decision. Is it going to veer into a pole and kill the driver or is it going to kill the person crossing the road? This is called the trolley problem. We've been dealing with it for decades, but it's real with AVs because it is a computer program. If you're driving, this happens, you make the decision. We've empowered the human, the driver, to make that determination. Now it's not a driver. It is a coder, someone who's sitting there making the code. Ethical issues are very significant. I also wanna highlight two other risks. One is the economic impacts and especially job displacement. You can look at every innovation in technology that's taken place and AI is no different. It kills jobs and it creates jobs. The problem is, and it may well create more than it kills, but if you are that warehouse worker who's now been replaced, or you are that delivery driver that's now been replaced, it doesn't do you any good that there are a lot of coding jobs out there. So we need to be thoughtful from a policy perspective about that. The last one I wanna highlight are the security risks. Cybersecurity is a big deal. AI is essentially computers. If it's in a computer, not in your brain, it is subject to an adversarial attack. And so as you're thinking about AI, understand the risks that are created associated with it. So hopefully at this stage, I've given you a perspective on what a AI is all about. We've looked at the benefits. We've talked about the risks. Let me wrap up with one last piece, and that is how do you get started on the AI journey? And here, the way I want you to think about this is we have a set of tools and techniques that we've been talking about. And some of those are more invasive, some are less invasive. So if you're using genetic profiling, really invasive. If you're using facial recognition, pretty invasive. In addition, when you think about use cases, you have some of them present more risk some are less risky. Genetic profiling, very risky. Facial recognition, risky. In our operations management world, however, there are lots of places, low risk, less invasive tools that can probably really make a difference for you. Whether that's improving your forecasting, using AI to do a better job with HR planning, thinking about inventory management, or of course, one of my favorites, thinking about queuing. So with that, I hope we've given you a perspective on how AI can work in your world. And now uh, we'll take a few minutes to, uh, for those of you who can stay on, to answer any questions you have. Great. Thank you so much, Mark. We have some questions here um, that were submitted. If you'd like to ask your question live, please raise your hand and we will call on you and ask you to unmute yourself. Um, so we have a couple questions here about regulation that I'm going to kind of combine into one. Um, a question about uh, what the role of the government is in regulating AI, um, but also um, are, 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 are our current regulations and systems that we have in place um, 
ready for an adoption of AI at a large scale. So things like privacy, protections, all of those. No, <laughs> I, I don't think- okay, next we, question. <laughs> I don't think we have the right regulatory framework and it's certainly not comprehensive. You actually, in, in one of you raised the issue around privacy. This is a huge issue. We've seen it in lots of domains, especially in social media. Uh, I'll take you to my AV example one more time. That autonomous vehicle is picking up all kinds of information. It has real-time video feed cameras that are seeing what's happening on the sidewalk, seeing what's happening in the stores. Who owns that data? Who controls that data? Big open issue, undetermined. In addition, coming back to this issue around what type of, what's government doing? So far, not very much. It depends where you live. In some, in some countries, it's more sophisticated. The UK has got a whole group working on creating a framework for how we're gonna deal with artificial intelligence. Here in the States, it tends to be a little bit more patchworked. Here's the dilemma. On one hand, you wanna protect people, both from a safety perspective, a privacy perspective, et cetera. On the other hand, you don't wanna stifle this amazing innovation. And so the regulator's role is to find a way to kind of give enough leeway, but still protecting. And that's something that they're working on right now. Great, thank you. It looks like we have a couple of live questions. So Yusuf, you unmute yourself. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Erica. And thank you, Prof. So well, my question is this, um, you spoke about these, um, uh, you know, uh, the risk around the AI, you know, having a system in place that does not really cut up uh, in the, the values of uh, humans around the globe. So, I mean, how do you, ask, I, I'm, I'm a machine learning engineer, so how do, you, how do you think, what do you advise, how do we sort of address of that, you know, and being a system that address, or addresses the challenge in my uh, local environment here. So, and I want the solution to also go global, you know, to be able to work for the global audience. Of course, I don't know what uh, values uh, to hold. So, how do you, I mean, how do you build a system that lasts and at the same time is more kind of uh, So I think, I think uh, let, me, let me take a crack at what I think you're after here. Uh, when, when I think about how do you take a, a component of AI or an AI system and bring it forward and ultimately take it to scale, I always start with a kind of a small chunk, whether you call it a pilot or an experiment. What you need to do is you need to initially, regardless of what the application is, demonstrate its efficacy, that it works, and that it is safe. On that last image I showed you, the risk is really important. But what you want to do is you want to start by showing, I can make this system work, and I can do it in a way that really mitigates risk. If you can do that, that enables you to kind of have the, the credibility, the street cred, to then be able to start to take it both horizontally into more geographies or more application, you know, more, more places, but then moving slightly up the risk scale as well, if you want to move it to places where you're not as confident or there's a little more risk associated with it. So I hope that helps. Let's yes, thank you so much. You're thank welcome. You. Uh, Charles, unmute yourself. Hi, Professor Mangan. Can Hi. You... Hey, uh, question. Um, you know, I work in food security and it's kind of twofold question. One is, you know, how, po I mean, what are the limitations of AI in terms of being able to predict you know, being able to meet the needs of a community in terms of, you know, food assistance. And the second one is as a nonprofit, financially, how liable or likely is it for an organization to be able to implement AI at this point? I mean, it seems to me it's like fairly, fairly expensive to do that. Or am I kind of think not, not aware of some other systems that might be in place to be able to, to use that? Well, your, your point about 
how complex it is, is, is a reasonable one. Uh, again, try and take yourself out of that big word chart I put up of all this AI stuff and pick a particular issue you're trying to solve. So if the issue is, how do I forecast the need for food in my community, then zero in on how can I use a computer, AI, to better do that forecasting? And one suggestion I'm gonna to offer to you, hmm. take your local university, look up and see who does AI, who does machine learning, who does big data, who does forecasting, send them an email and say, hi, I am in this business. I'm trying to provide food security for our community. I could really use some help with forecasting. Come help. And I suspect you'll find people willing to do it because A, it gives the students a learning opportunity and B, it gives you an op the, the, the academic community an opportunity to work in the world, in the real world. Excellent idea. Thank you very much. And uh, we have a question here in the Q&A that builds off of that a little bit. Um, where are the greatest opportunities for developing academic research in this area? And where are the uh, major theoretical gaps? Well, I think the, the biggest theoretical gap is the, how do you get to the neural networks? And the, again, the best illustration I can give you of that is the four-way stop sign with autonomous vehicles. I, I'm, I'm fascinated by it because I've been in AVs when they get to a four-way stop sign and they just don't know how to deal with it. And ultimately what happens is the safety driver takes over and figures it out. Getting to a point where that idea of a neural network can actually integrate being able to see the eyes of the other drivers and interpret what that means, being able to look at the body language of that driver and across from you and know, okay, I'm going to let them go. That is, I think, the next frontier from my perspective. But I only, I got one slice of this. I'm kind of an operations person in this domain. Uh, I'm sure in the healthcare world, uh, education, lots of potential I don't even know about. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Purna. Purna, you can unmute yourself. You there? Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor, uh, for a very uh, wonderful and comprehensive presentations on AI uh, because I am uh, taking the lead uh, the public policy program and my question is how can we use this AI into the policy making or policy analysis and recently we have established uh, the policy lab at Kathmandu University I'm from Nepal and also we are trying to uh, adopt this AI as a methodological tool uh, for policy making, policy analysis, policy implementations, and the policy monitoring and evaluation. And how can we proceed further? Is there any possibility to collaborate between uh, your institutions and our policy lab? Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So let me zero in on the issue of how AI can support policy analysis. When we come to evaluate policies, one of the, if, if you use any of the kind of traditional policy analysis methodologies, what you do is you've got your problem statement, you go gather some evidence, you establish what your evaluation criteria for this policy will be, you identify some options, and then you have to project what will happen if you adopt option one, option two, option three. It is in the assessment and the projection of what's likely to happen that I think you can make some real inroads using AI because it allows you to look at more factors and consider more potential outcomes than you would otherwise have. So there's an example, I think, in the design of the policy where you can use AI. But let me also suggest that AI building on your question, can also help on the evaluation 
of policy. Because one of the challenges we all face in policy is typically it takes a long time to see did the policy have the intended impact we wanted? So for example, if you're doing early childhood education policy, it takes literally years, in some cases decades, to know whether you got what you wanted. Here, AI may be able to help you by simulating out what the impacts will be based on initial data, so it's kind of extrapolating, but doing it a little better than we might do with a regression analysis, but also using the data as it continues to build over time to get smarter about what those projections might be. So those are two places you can do it. In terms of collaborations, there are lots of places uh, you can find, you know, reach out to people. You'd be surprised, I, I think, on their interest level. So give that a try. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, Obi, can you unmute yourself? Thank you. Thank you very much for a very enlightening uh, presentation. Um, you mentioned the uh, question, the area of um, ethical issues around AI. So what would be your thoughts on how best to manage these uh, ethical issues? Are you recommending uh, some kind of regulation or something like that? Well, I think there are, there are two obligations. I think regardless of the regulation, the person designing the AI system and ultimately using it has an obligation themselves to make sure that they are providing uh, an ethical foundation for the use of that technology. Uh, as I mentioned, we've seen that recently where uh, some major corporations have rethought their resume screening AI systems because they came to recognize that there was in innate systemic bias in it and that that's not appropriate. So it should be the burden of the, the designer and the user but as a fail safe to that, I think policymakers do have an obligation here, especially uh, if the AI has any kind of uh, safety or potentially even equity risks associated with it. What the specifics of that are, there you gotta kind of dig into the, the, you know, what's really going on to determine what the right level of regulation is. Again, because I'm trying to balance getting the benefits of this new incredibly powerful technology with making sure I don't uh, you know, quash it too early in order to get that equity that you asked for. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. We have time for one last question. Idowu, you can unmute yourself. Good afternoon. Hi. How are you doing? So it's been very insightful, like my, you know, other people mentioned. I just want to ask a question. Can AI be used around market models to study new, you know, tech to, you know, bring about, think about new technology in financial system? The answer to that is yes. And there are several ways in which you can accomplish that. Um, it, whenever I think about anything, operation, I think about it as a system. And what AI can do, and I didn't really, in this lecture, we get into the role of AI as a supply chain management tool. Supply chain management and systems thinking isn't just about you know, your widgets. It is about service delivery and thought processes as well. And so AI in combination with system dynamics becomes a very powerful way of doing exactly what you asked. 